Good morning to you and thanks for joining us on the run-up today. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. And my name is Uchechuku Onode. We also have on standby by Oloake. Good. Uh, welcome to the program, Bayo. Good morning, viewers, and it's nice to be part of today's edition. Okay, today we will be uh, on the road to uh, 2023, as it were. General election will, is coming up in 2023, and everybody is talking about it. The election, we keep getting closer and closer to that day, and the question on the minds of Nigerians are, uh, what should be expected? How ready are we, really? Uh, will this one be different from the past elections? These are, and more questions will be answered by... Uh, uh, a human rights activist, I would like to call him, and a public commentator, a lawyer also by profession, public affairs analyst, so many things rolled into one. Mr. Leborius Osama will be joining us to say that. And also, the showdown between ASU and the federal government continues. The question is, why does it seem like the labor unions are quiet? Uh, sometime in April, they came out to talk to the federal government about being silent uh, as a strike progressed. But after then, nothing has been heard from them. We will be having this conversation with Comrade Fidelis Ede. He is a lawyer, a farmer, and a former labor leader. I like the sound of farmer. Whenever they say farmer, I know that when we're talking farming, we're talking food security as well, <laughs> so that yes. we don't have to fear. But uh, we will also still have a, a third guest that will be talking to us on uh, the same road to 2023, a different perspective from what Laborious Osama will be talking to us about. Without even having to take a break, because uh, uh, Osama is waiting already, we'd like to go to him. Hello and welcome to the program, Mr. Osama. Summer. Yeah, good morning. Okay, the elections uh, are approaching. It's a matter of weeks now. We shouldn't even be counting months. Mm. Uh, first of all, are we ready as a people? Um, if we are ready for election, I will tell you, yes, Nigerians are ready for election. The Nigerians that have consistently voted are ready for election. The politicians also that knows what um, election is are ready for election. Um, I don't know about other people, uh, but I can tell you that Nigerians have never been this ready. Hmm. There have been a lot of uh, debates back and forth uh, on um, the road to the election. There have been mudslinging uh, consistent of our campaign consistent with our campaign. Before the campaign, there were a lot of, um, um, a lot of issues on whether the uh, campaign should be issue-based. Uh, but we also know that that's far from what we see now. What you hear are most slinging and then, um, you know, less of how Nigeria will move forward. And so, uh, please, I also need you to quickly correct my name. My yeah. name is not Laboros. My name is Liboros. L I B O R O U S. Please. Uh, that said, um, if, if whether Nigerians are ready, Nigerians are ready. But whether election will take us away from the current position we are in is a different kettle of fish mm. altogether. But if we are ready, Nigerians are ready. A lot of people have been saying your PVC, your PVC. But I tell people, the, the stress and the hurdles you have to cross to register for your permanent voter's card is, you know, different from the one you will have to cross to collect the permanent voter's card. So there are still people who are waiting to collect their permanent voter's card. So to that extent, um, I don't know how prepared INEC is in respect of distribution. But come uh, for election, Nigerians are ready to vote. And if you ask them to come out and vote on Saturday, they want to be get it done and over with. All right. Uh, a couple of elections have happened very recently. Uh, I'm talking about the Ocean State elections and, of course, the most recent, which is the Anambra State elections. Uh, what lessons do you think we can take away from these most recent elections, uh, uh, you know, judging from 2023? There are no lessons, uh, um, uh, basically, really, apart from... There's no difference from the elections we have had so far uh, for the politicians, 
they keep um, you know taking one or two things away I let consistently we promised that um, elections you know were going to be different we saw that yes with the beavers um, consistent with modern technology you know some persons now can monitor you know elections from the polling unit as they are being uploaded but the first thing like i always tell people the first sacrament to election being different is you know having a different perspective to all the elections mm. we're talking about diaspora voting we're talking about online voting if there's no diaspora voting there's no online voting and your election is not going to be different um, so you're still going to have the same you know people troop out to the polling unit to vote uh, on the day of election and at the end of the day results are counted and then um, uploaded you know in INET website and people are going to monitor how aware is the voter how educated have we educated them you know is there still going to be vote, vote, vote buying vote show me the vote and then come and collect money yes there will still be uh, do you still have a lot of um, you know illiterate voters who you know the babasope kind of voters yes they are still there do you still have people who mainly are voting they really don't understand why they are voting yes they are still there these are largely what determines the outcome of the nigerian election so do we have you know recently we saw the midterm election in america and two weeks before the poll people were already you know early voters were already trooping to vote do we have that in nigeria that is going to Created the departure from what we know no the answer is no we are still talking about voters uh, card collection that's what will you know the instrument you need to activate to make you eligible how many people have been able to collect the answer is still no i is still um, you know not forthcoming with that and then secondly like i said can we vote online can the diaspora vote just like it happened in kenya in malawi no the answer is no so with all of this so what it means is that, apart from beavers, um, card readers were introduced in 2015. In 2019, yes, uh, uh, beavers was introduced. We just also consistently modernized it. Uh, in Oshu, in Ekiti, in um, Anambra, consistent of the political parties, we saw the outcome. So if you put all of this in the mix, there's basically nothing that will change in the election. You're still going to have the dominant parties carry the day with some of these fringe parties, you know, lagging behind. That, that's basically, you know, there's, there's no go, going to be any upset. Well, but you talked about um, Oshun, Kitty, and Anambra. In, in Oshun, a lot of people feel uh, the election where, the previous election where the, the now uh, elected governor of Oshun State contested, he could have won if things that are now available were available then. Uh, a lot of people felt that he even won that election, but it was upturned because there were no evidences every, anywhere else that could have supported him to uh, be the winner of that election. So I'm wondering why you still said that there is no marked difference in the, the conduction of this election that led to the winning of Adelike, for instance, if not in any other state. Let me, let me tell you, um, in that um, the previous election, the 20, 2018 election in Oshun, if you remember, um, Omishore was then in PDP. Mm. Uh, it was almost as if Adeleke was going to carry the day. And the elections were postponed. And then the likes of Omishore, because elections were postponed in some part of Ife, the likes of Omishore, the APC leaders were to woo Omishore to support the APC. And that was when Omishore decamped to APC. These are party leaders that have, you know, massive followers in their domain. The defection of Omishore played a major role in the 2018 election in Osho, except you are not a keen follower of elections in, at that level. Also, if you look at the 2022 election in Osho, before the election, Arabe Shola, who was a governor in that state, fell out with Tinubu and Oyetola, the outgoing governor. Arabe Shola is a factor in uh, Oshun, whether he's still a governor or not. And so he still has his followers, who were not happy the way he was uh, treated in, uh, by the powers that be in the Southwest, especially the way Tinubu 
and Oyotola treated him. Arabe Shola on the day of election was said to be in America. Arabe Shola's supporter, who ordinarily would have supported the APC, also stayed aloof. So if you look at the margin between the APC and the PDP, it was about 23,000 votes or so. That margin, if Arabe Shola had supported the APC, APC probably would have closed that gap. Mind you, their delicate family in Oshu are not a family you toil with when it comes to election. In Ede, they have consistently controlled that domain. Uh, Isiaka, the elder brother, was a governor in that state. He has consistently built political structure. That was why the moment he died, not that there were no people in the party when the man died, but the party leaders had to give the ticket in PDP because they wanted that senatorial seat. They know that the only family that could give them that victory was a delicate family. They gave it to the dancer, who is today the governor-elect. <laughs> so they already understand the political influence that that family controls. So coming a, 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 against a sitting governor, it was easier and it would have been better for the APC to put their house in order. The APC was the house divided against itself. That was why you saw what happened in Osho. So let not be deceived that it was because INEC introduced beavers. It is the same voters. They are the same voters. If a new party had created an upset, let's assume, look at, let me take your mind quickly to a kitty. A kitty also, um, what's, the, what's, what's the name of um, the former governor? Um, Oni, Shegu Oni was in PDP, but he left PDP because he was not given the ticket of PDP and he went into SDP. If Shegu Oni, even though the, to put the total number of votes of the PDP and the SDP together, the APC still defeated them, but if Shegu Oni had remained in PDP and he had been given the ticket, because the candidate of the PDP was unknown, so if he had remained in the PDP and had been given the ticket in the PDP, they probably would have worked twice as hard. And some persons that, you know, went to the APC probably would have also had sympathy for Chevroni, being a former APC member and a former governor in the state. So these are the factors that are still playing out in our election. You don't have a situation where persons who are resident outside the domain of Nigeria who participate in the election through electronic voting. You don't have persons who will not be able to come out on the day of election for fear of insecurity, going out to conduct their vote, you know, before the day of poll. That's what you call early voting. So all of these things are still not there. You still have a situation in Nigeria, pre uh, building up to 2023, 20, where people, where the politicians, we still panda to region. You have a massive voting population in the north where they would still go you know, talk to the Almajiris, talk to the Talakawas, the plebeians, or talk to the bourgeois to also talk to their people. You still have a situation where you will want you will pander to the market woman more than people who are in diaspora because they have no vote. You also see a situation where people will tell you you are an online warrior because you have no PVC. So are these are here? factors. Yes, I I I would I yeah. would take your so, factors. Th thank you very much. This is a very succinct analysis uh, that you have given uh, with facts and uh, verifiable projections. Um, I was just thinking, you know, from the standpoint of those who might want to revisit the Oshun, the first election, so to speak, uh, which um, uh, Governor elect Adeleke ran against um, Oyetola. Um, there are those who would say that despite the omission factor, which you rightly also alluded to, uh, and the other projections that, that were made, it still took the APC two elections and a court case to produce the governor. What would be your response to those who advance this argument? Two elections and a court case in a case? Yes. Or in yes. A in Osho, no, I'm talking about Osho, two elections and a court case for Yetona to be governor, despite the omission factor. So what would be your response to those 
who, who you know advance this this line of argument yeah because mind you um in um in 2015 there were a lot of hopes from the the uh, people on uh, the apc and its candidates there were in fact the slogan was anything but jonathan away with his phd people said 20, uh, uh, 2011, people were happy. Yes, we have somebody who didn't, who had no shoes, who had no shoes, who could feel our pain. But Jonathan had a lot of goodwill. He frittered it away. By 2015, people want anything but Jonathan. But the same people, the same APC that promised El Dorado in 2015 to hit the ground running, started running away from the ground. So all of those factors also affected the outcome of the election in Oshun State. Because, also quickly before I go there, Otoge, the Otoge movement in Kwara, today, then people wanted anything but the Saraki dynasty. But the same people that sponsored the Otoge movement today are complaining that the, they've had a lot of hopes on the current governor, but he has frittered away most of those are goodwill. That was the same thing that played out in Oshu, in, um, uh, in Oshu State, just before Oyetola came in. That people thought that Arab Beshola, Arab Beshola also had, was owing salaries consistently. Arab Beshola's tenure in Oshu State is what the bookmakers will not, bookkeepers will not want to remember in a long time. If you remember, Arab Beshola consistently was in the news for the wrong reasons. Because, mind you, Arabe Shola won election through the tribunal and people breathed a sigh of relief that away from PDP and their shenanigans. But Arabe Shola was also not different. So, then came the uh, Adeleke factor. So, people felt, yes, Adeleke already had a, a structure. His brother's structure was there. The family had money. And so, people wanted to try something different. And mind you, they also didn't like the way Tinubu was playing the politics in Lagos. That you bring people from Lagos, impose on the on, on these locals. So and then that uh, Oyetola was related to Tinubu. Tinubu was already detecting what was happening in Lagos. He could not be detecting what was said to be happening in Osho. Okay. So if you also take quickly what um, um, uh, Arab Shola said during the quarter, he said Tinubu promised him, support to Yotola, you play the politics here while he will concentrate on governor. So for that, there seems to be a consensus added them. But because also, Tinubu, or Arabe Shola was not too popular. And so they had to woo the Omishore factor, faction. Omishore also, yes, had a clout, but the election was almost, you know, won by the Aldele case. But the APC needed a little manipulation. Security operatives that they complained against in 2011, you know, became handy. So these are factors that consistently play out in Nigerian elections. So I still Thank see you. them. Okay. I still yeah. see them playing out in in the 2023 okay, general just, election. Just a very quick one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, to... yeah sorry, young girl, because uh, we, we spent a lot of time on our show, but it's very illustrative and instructive, you know, of the dynamics of the Nigerian political environment. I was, exactly. just going to, exactly. yes, I was just going to say, now, the way you so articulately advanced all these factors that impacted our show, what are the factors you see coming to play in 2023? Because Fantastic. Think, yeah, what are those factors? Fantastic. You see, when I, that, I took time to explain all of these factors, the importance of people, the importance of structure, political structures, in Nigerian election. I was giving an anal analysis recently somewhere, and I said, look, a local government chairman, for example, why do you think governors conduct local government election just few months to the expiration of their tenure? Because they know a local government chairman has largesse to distribute. Unlike that man who is not in the office, he will give you promissory notes. So for the local government, the sitting governor, for example, he has something to negotiate with. Which is why Wiki is a big factor against the uh, uh, article today. If they can do anything to bring him back in the fold, they will do that. Because he has largesse to distribute, he has the funds. 
the state governors in Nigeria has have funds. You look at the spread as as unpopular as the government of Buhari seems to be. The APC seems to have a little upper edge because they have more governors. And their governors are not as dissident as the PDP governors that you have today, led by Wiki, who is not happy with the outcome of what is playing out in his own party. If you also see the APC governors already trying to woo him, the five of them have visited him consistently. You know, everybody is going to Wiki. The PDP, you know, is banking on the fact that Atiku is a Northerner. And being a Northerner, that the North are naturally going to pander towards, you know, gravitate towards the North. But the governors also know the implication of a Northerner handing, handing over to a Northerner. If a Northerner handed, hands over to a Northerner, the crisis in the South, especially considering the, the tribalism and the nepotism of the Buhari's administration, which was why the Northern governors also, you know, kicked against Ahmed Lawa, the production of Ahmed Lawa as a candidate. So to that extent, I think the Northern APC governors are going to work together to, for once, also find a way to strike a balance. It's a give and take thing. So let's, we have one of us, a former governor, a former senator, as a running mate. And consistently he's been saying to be given a, a, a prominence in the in this team so that will give them an edge in that light for Atiku, consistently his major vote from the south had been in the southeast and that southeast now had branched off to obi so that is taking a chunk of Atiku's vote away Tinu, um, um uh, what do you call it um colin uh Wike, despite his disagreement with the party in 2019 Supported the party massively with funds and logistics. Today, Wike is leading five governors away from the PDP. Just the same way Atiku led five governors, initially seven, and then later became five. Just the same way Atiku led five governors away from the PDP in 2015. So today, Wike is leading five governors away, and they might be six if Bala Mohammed joins them. So, and then you have the Kwakwansu factor. The Kwakwansu also left PDP. Right there in Kano, he commands, you know, some form of, of also the Kwankwasia movement. So all of these are going to play out in the PDP affair. But for the Labour Party, the Labour Party, you have a lot of elites and then, you know, fantastic messages, you know, and more of logistics. Recently, I saw them looking at a, a, a voter's register and urging INEC to remove underage voter. That is late in the day. INEC... We, we, we know Nigeria, and they can't do that now. So we have consistently point out, pointed out on the age voter in those registers, even fictitious names in some cases. And I have said that our voters' register is over bloated. But nobody cares to listen. And the fact that they do not have sitting governors in Labour Party, they do not even have a sitting local government uh, councillor, that is going to work massively against them. Because if you go to Oshun, for example, you can say, Adeleke will give me 500,000 votes. The PDP can say, Adeleke will deliver 500,000 votes for us. Labor cannot point to somebody who will give them equal number of votes in any of the states. It's all going to be, you know, these young people, a lot of them who are still struggling to collect their PVCs. So that is why I'm, I'm telling you that the major political parties will still be the ones that will determine you know, the outcome of the general election with the fringe parties lagging behind them. These are all the factors from my prison. It's, it's been a, a marathon one, Liborius, <laughs> as always. And we'd like to thank you so much for giving perspective to uh, this topic. Uh, the days leading to 2023 are still a bit far if we're talking about discussing the things that will lead up to that and give us what we would at least a semblance of what we want 2023 and beyond to be. And so we are going to still uh, require your services as time goes on. Thank you for being no part problem, of the program. No problem, At your service nationwide. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was uh, the Boreos Osama, uh, a, 
a, a legal practitioner, human rights activist, a public affairs commentator, and so many things. And he said, at your service nationwide. I remember an <laughs> athlete that used to do that, uh, but let me not mention that. It, it was fun having him. Uh, Bio, it was, it was a really critical question that you, yes. you asked about his projections, things that will lead to uh, the outcome that we are we are going to have in 2023. That was really yeah. a, a nice one there. Uh, but he has, mm. he has painted a picture that seems so clear from his own words and all that. And I don't know what you think about his entire analysis. Yes, um, his analysis uh, were quite um, instructive and quite also um, logical. Um, the, the position that I advanced, I know those who argue that if the APC was that strong, strong, uh, why did it take two elections despite the uh, mm. support for them and a court case to deliver the governorship? You know, likewise, there are also those, although I didn't, we didn't have the opportunity to engage him, you know, more. But one, one other perspective that would have been good to hear from him would be the perspective of those who argue that if Labour parties will be true, they don't have a councillor, they don't have governors, but that if Obi, for example, gets the bulk of the votes of the South East as his primary constituency, is it not possible for Obi to get one quarter of the votes in most of the states of the South, uh, of the South especially, you know, and then given the disenchantment of the middle belt with attacks by bandits uh, and, and all of this insecurity that the middle belt in particular has suffered, was there no possibility that the middle belt would go to Obi rather than go to uh, former Vice President Atiku, okay, or uh, Ashiwaju and his group? So there's this position and, and is, is a very strong position of those who are, you know, advancing it to say that that actually will make Obi's candidature a very strong candidature in this election, not to be dismissed as for people saying he doesn't have any structure. I think uh, early this morning where uh, some people were trying to argue or, or look at a projection for 2023 and they said, Apart from the OB that you're calling, the other candidates that are frontline line candidates uh, may be banking on intimidation and uh, so many other uh, factors that are not if, are illegal, let me call it illegal, because they may be desperate so that they know the places they may not have votes and they will go there to disrupt the election. Only that can be the one that will save them. If this is allowed to play out, then maybe what they're talking about structures will really affect the OB candidature that you're talking about. Because structure, when you talk, is the people. OB has the people. But the structures in the Nigerian context are those people who can lay their lives to make sure that the vote that doesn't come to their principal gets missing or is never cast. So we have to factor that into the equation as well when we're talking about 2023. So maybe mo more needs to be done in areas of security and other factors that will uh, enable us have a free and fair election in 2023. And talking about the place of security, I was going to say that, you know, when you talked about, um, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, structure yeah. in the, uh, you know, from the Nigerian factor, uh, how that people are ready to lay their lives, which is very true. Um, if, if you lay your ears down in the streets, you would hear the conversation conversations already going on about the plans of boys and that's the most i can say mm, about that boys. Uh, but then uh, you hear also people especially the young persons who are obedient if i'm to use that word say things like uh, uh okay get your get your pvcs get ready because that is the only way you can participate and make a change or make a difference but then by the time you look at it critically a lot of these people, whether obedient or not, are scared for their lives because it's like, uh, it's like a, a, a straight up division. It's either you are ready to lay your life or you're not. So you have a lot of people who are also going to be affected by the security situation. They're already projecting 
it's not me people are going to use and do whatever on that day you know that saying that from the street language uh, people are scared are they really is that really going to be a difference in the security situation that is actually what i'm driving at because you, it, it, it's 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 not news i mean you hear gunshots you hear people tell their own stories about situations they had to face mm -hmm. because they just went to vote mm. do you understand well a lot more like i said will, will have to be done to assure the people the, it may not be a p picture of gloom and doom, all that. It may not be the way people are seeing it that it might be. Uh, but w everybody needs to be reassured in some way that the security will be tight for that, those days that we're going to have election in 2023. Because everybody is ready to vote, but not everybody is ready to risk their lives because of voting. And there's always been this card that has been played by politicians that, okay, um, just make them not come. Because if there's voter apathy, there's a likelihood that the only people that will go out will be the ones that are uh, core supporters of whoever has that catchment area, as it were. So something has to be done to assure the people. Now that there's a semblance of confidence in INEC, there should also be that kind of confidence in the security apparatus. Um, okay, I mean, you, 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 you said it quite succinctly, and, and Uche as well has heightened the fears that people have. Uh, I think Uche also put it quite clearly that people are quite worried. But let's not forget a few things, because again, those who, who would want um, their own position favored, and knowing that if it was a level playing field, it might not work for them will try to discourage people. So let's get one or two things clear, which I, from my observation, number one, the president and commander in chief of the armed forces, President Buhari, I believe knows that one of the things that can assure his legacy is to conduct a free and fair election. You know, he has seen that uh, with president, former president Jonathan, and also even with President Obasanjo as a military head of state who handed over power on, on October 1, 1979, at a time when it was unprecedented for a military leader in Africa to return power to civilians. And we knew what that made Obasanjo into. Obasanjo became an international figure immediately to the extent that Obasanjo was one of those, together with former Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Fraser, the former Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Sridhar Ramphal, who formed the eminent persons group that ended apartheid in South Africa. And that's how the statue of Obasanjo rose. So Jonathan also accepted the results, did not tamper with the election. And we have seen how President Jonathan has become a leading African Union ambassador for resolving conflicts in Africa. So President Buhari knows that Despite the challenges his administration has had, okay, if he delivers on a successful election, his legacy could be fairly reasonably assured. Secondly, the body language that we are seeing, some have said that the change in the design of the Naira could also be an attempt to ensure a level playing field in the political space. Thirdly, I think people should not buy the argument that their votes may not count. I, I cannot be naming specific places, but if you do a proper analysis of the last election, if you just pick a few pockets of the last election, you will see that certain individuals lost in certain places that were almost unbelievable. And if you allow me, because it's public figure, from open sources, the, 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 the word in the presidential villa was won by the PDP. The Victoria Garden City, where the vice president, Roger Baju, lived before he became vice president, was won by the PDP. Despite even the vice president campaigning house to house there. So I just give you these two quick examples. And there are those who might even venture to suggest that Bodilon Rodikui voted for PDP. And that's where Ashiwaju Bolatino stays. So when people tell you that your votes may not count, or they will tamper with your votes, or they Sometimes it is just to intimidate and to discourage people. 
votes still count in Nigeria, and they count significantly. And I think that we need to send this message out for people to know that their votes will count. If their votes will not count, people will not make attempts to buy those votes from them. Or people will not even be thinking, like Uche has rightly said, People, will not, some, some disgruntled politicians will not be thinking of discouraging people from coming to vote. Because they know that those votes will count. And this is why I think we should be optimistic about the elections. Three election will be very safe. Uh, I don't know how that conviction comes, uh, but I, I believe it strongly that it will be safe, at least safer than people are trying to project. People are trying to think that it will be. And I, I'm comfortable going into 23, mm. 2023 with that kind of uh, mindset. And I think everybody should believe that as well, that uh, it's going to be safer than people are trying to make us. Like Bayo has said, sometimes it's just to make people uh, not come out. It's yeah. just to encourage people that we will show you here and all that. But you can only rig election in a place where you are popular. Because if you are one man in a place where a hundred others are in support of someone else, there's no way you can snatch True. a ballot box or do anything. And get so away with Yeah, it. and get away with it. You can only do that when you're popular. But We'll take a break now and return. Let me just prepare your mind. We just saw uh, recently here the federal government on Wednesday launched the National Animal Identification System and Traceability System to transform the nation's livestock industry. And one of the reasons they gave, I'm talking to you, Bio, now, uh, is that it will help in the farmer header clashes. So when we return, and if we have some time, we'll talk about it and... I, I would like to know what you feel about that, if you think also that this is going to be the solution to the header and farmer clashes in Nigeria. But when we return here, we're hoping to be joined by someone who will be able to talk about the uh, role of uh, unions in all these, especially uh, taking the ASU and federal government case into uh, focus. Stay with us. <laughs> 